Hello, everyone. Hi there. Wow, incredible to see you all here today. Welcome to Hauser and Worth. I'm Russell Salmon, Director of Public Programs here at the Gallery, and we are so thrilled to welcome you here this afternoon for this exciting conversation between artist Harmony Kareen and LAX Art Deputy Director and Curator Catherine Taft. This program celebrates the opening weekend of Harmony's debut solo show at Hauser & Wirth, Aggressive Drifter, which features a new series of paintings drawn from the artist's forthcoming film, Agro Drift, to be released later this fall. Before we get started, I just want to ask that uh, everyone refrain from taking photos and videos during the talk. We just want to I'll be in this room together without a sea of iPhones in the audience. So thank you for hearing us on that. And thank you again for being here. And now please join me in welcoming Harmony Kareen and Catherine Taft. Harmony Kareen in this bitch. Welcome I'm to up Los in it. Yeah. Harmony, thank you so much for bringing us the show and for uh, your time and this talk today. And thank you to Russell and Hauser and Worth. Um, you know, I want to talk to you about what's almost three decades now of artistic production in cinema, film, writing, painting, and sort of what, um, if you could over give us an overview of the project that's brought us to this show, these paintings, and the related film. All right, well, let's break it down. What's the first part? <laughs> it's hard to be 30 serious. Years. So, 30 so, years have brought you to this moment. 30 years? The past 30 years of, of your artistic career. What brought me here? Fuck, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you know, art, art, I was gonna think, I was thinking about this the other day. It's like, it's a, it is, it's a difficult thing to talk about. Um, I'm going to try my best, you know, but there's something, it's hard, it's hard to talk about in a lot of ways because it's like, it's one of those things I, I still feel now that it's like sometimes words like diminish or it's almost like it's something that's like best felt. So I'm going to like try to articulate some of this. Uh, I might sound... Stupid, but you know, go for it. Thirty years of of uh, of work. Um, I don't know how I got here. Yeah, I mean, I think what's brought you to this moment, where I I see a real breakthrough, yeah, both technologically okay, and aesthetically, in this body of work, um, as opposed to previous projects. Yeah. And... Okay, how I got to this moment um, with these paintings specifically, um, I. They, they come, they're like, the, the source is a film, but it's almost not a film, really. I, a couple of years ago, I, I've always kind of been um, anxious, and my attention span is, is, is pretty short, and I, I get bored of things even that I make, and I never really feel like I've adjusted to the time in a way. Um, and I, a lot of this is my, my career and has been in my, an attempt to also keep myself entertained. And, um, and never really feeling like I belong to a specific time or place or point in the culture. So, you know, I've always done everything because I always felt like it was all the same. And I've never really tried to differentiate between any of the forms because I always felt like they all spoke to the same thing. And there was something I've been chasing my whole life, which is what's beyond a kind of articulation. And in a lot of ways, it was easy for me to describe or, I, or oh, this is what I want to say or this is what I want. I would just not make it. So a lot of it is a search for 
the unknown or the und or things that are undefined, which then it becomes difficult to articulate. And a couple of years ago, I th I just started losing interest in in narr in traditional linear narrative form, uh, and then I started. I w I've always kind of wanted to like make things that were more uh, immersive and experiential that felt kind of closer to a vibration. And I started playing more games, started looking at things and, and live action was, I was starting to like, oh, I don't know, it's not so, you know, it's just, it felt like it was just the same thing over and over again. And it, it was made, it was, everything felt like it was run through some type of algorithm watching a lot of anime, playing games, seeing things that are I was a kind of singularity starting to form this idea of like, interesting, you know, art and film and anime and gaming and music was starting to like merge into this kind of one thing. It was all in some ways entertainment, but it started to feel like it was becoming this one thing. And then watching the viewing habits, my own viewing habits, my own attention span, my kids and how they're doing. I was noticing that there wasn't just like, it wasn't like one object that people were paying attention to or I'm watching a movie now or I'm watching a game or I'm on Twitch or there was this thing that was like, like it was everything at once. So I would be like listening to music, playing, you know, playing a game, watching a show, uh, you know, kids are on Snap, filters and I was I was like wow there's a, it was the, a, a different language was I, I just I was like wow there's this kind of like it's a sensory bombardment in this kind of very interesting way and so um and then there was the through line of gaming and gaming aesthetics and gaming engines and all these things and I started to feel like the first time that the tech was starting to like actually be at the same level as like my imagination it was the first time where I now is really the first time where I felt like you could really encounter a kind of deep world creation in a way that wasn't possible even a year or two ago. So Agro was really an attempt for me, I'm not saying this is the future and this is whatever. For me, it was an attempt to see what was beyond film or what was beyond a kind of linear storytelling. And and so I started working, I, I formed this company, we started called Edgelord. We started working with like gaming kids and hackers and uh, and VFX and AI and, and all the tech that I could put together. It was closer to something that was like, like a design collective. And really the first, uh, the, the, the only thing I was like, I was like, well, let's try to make like a proof of concept or something to basically, because what, what I was searching for didn't really exist. And so I was like, What's, what's something beyond this kind of two-dimensional thing? But also I was like, I did want there to be a narrative and characters and emotion. It wasn't just a, a, um, an, a, a tech exercise of making some kind of cool filter or whatever. It was, it was more like, how do we like go beyond? And maybe there's like the emergence of gaming or gaming, gamifying this kind of thing and gaming aesthetics and, the, and everything. And so I, we, we kind of developed this uh, this one project, which is really just the first. This really is the first lob in what I'm going to be continue doing. You know, um, this is the first thing I finished it actually eight months ago, and I just sat on it until this moment. But I've already made the second thing, which is completely goes past this. Okay. The, the the art the the paintings are actually you know to bring it back to the paintings and the paintings use that source material but are in some ways old fashioned they're very much different the process is very simple just oil on canvas just renderings of actual imagery from the from the game or from the film um, so th again I almost hesitate I to call it it's really not a movie it was right. never meant to be a movie we went in not even no one knew. Or thought of it as a film. I just called it that because I, I, I started calling them blinks because I need another name. Right. And this project that you're referring to 
is AgroDrift. It, it is a feature length blink or experience um, premiered at Venice Film Festival, I think a few weeks ago, and um, you know, has entered into the kind of cinematic discourse at this point. And yet here we have a painting show with works drawn from that project. Um, I'm just wondering, you know, what is the relationship, especially as you describe with Edgelord, the kind of speed that things are being created at, to really slow down and make a painting, focus on one still. You know, these are, I had the great privilege of seeing the film, which hasn't been released yet in the US. And these are memorable moments in the project. And, um, you know, how do you make that decision that that then becomes a painting? Uh, I don't know. It's just, it's a, it's a energy. It's like a, a vibe I'm chasing. It really is like, they're just, some of these are like really just details of much bigger, like source imagery. So like that character, those characters in the back, there could be a whole other landscape or something behind it. Just would isolate it, go in. A lot of it was done on, I started on my, I make a lot of art on my phone and just, or at least that's like the template for what becomes something bigger. But, um, yeah, and then just trial and error. Some things work, some things don't work, um, and editing it down. And yeah. And is is the painting for you just another platform? You know, among the video game, the film, the you know TikTok, whatever it is that you're producing with your. I, mean, I your just love. I, I always love painting. It's just I love the rules of it. I love how they exist. I wanted these things to feel like they were like carved of color. Yeah. You know, like colors really taken. Oh. For me, like a huge, it's almost taken over everything: color, light, energy. Like I, I want things to feel like they're like carved from like the sky or something, you know. Um, so, um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but the paintings are, yeah, it's a way to isolate and condense and tr and translate. And then there's like a power, just the, the image itself, the singularity. But. Yeah, painting is probably my favorite. Okay. And, and so we should explain um, AgroDrift, the film, for lack of a better term, um, was shot entirely in infrared uh, thermal imaging cameras that you borrowed from NASA. Um, they create this kind of incredibly high-res, big data flattening into this striated grid, right? The sort of rainbow that, that we see in the paintings. Yeah, we use thermal cameras. I, as the base, there's a lot more. There's thermal, there's VFX, there's AI, there's all these layers to it. But at, at the base, thermal was really pushing the idea of color into something hyper magical. I was calling it like a glitch world, like this, it's, it's like a glitching kind of thing where it's in the real world but pushed into something hyper um, like color field. And also, I like the idea with thermal is interesting because it's heat based. Heat is really soul. So it's like this strange thing where we're, depending on the heat of the character, the, where the, the distance between the character and the subject reacts in a specific way. It is like a somewhat reflective of like the soul. There, it is like capturing some kind of, I, I call it a liquid narrative, but um, yeah. Yeah, I was in, in watching the film and seeing the show, I, I would call it like a heat-seeking eye, that your viewers then have that heat-seeking eye as well, and, yeah. and they're kind of searching out that extra layer of, of content or emotion. And, and it's quite an emotional film as well. I mean, I would argue it also has a kind of slowness and meditativeness about it. Hell yeah. <laughs> Which, you know, would, would like belie the, the yeah. sort of like, acceleration of digital culture, yeah. you know, the kind of constant consuming and generating and producing. Yeah. This film really, and the paintings, really slow all that. Yeah, down. apparently only disturbed people find it emotional. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was, it was an emotional experience for me. And, oh. you know, it's <laughs> I'm not Ser Serbian, but... Um, I'm just saying. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I, how could you... How, could you describe to us that kind of new technique? I think um, I would be hard pressed to, to call the new film a narrative. I mean, yeah. I think it, it is art and yeah. it is, it has the slowness of art and it has a kind of um, complexity that yeah. films don't do. I'm just trying to fuck it up. I mean, 
<laughs> honestly, I really am just trying to fuck it all up because, like, what I'm what I'm trying to make didn't really exist, and what I think when we talk about this in terms of narrative, I think it is narrative. I just think it's a, a different type of narrative. It's a story, right? There's a story, there's characters, there's, com there's some type of complexity to, you know, the journey. It's, an, it's a narrative, it's just not like plotted in a way. So, because I don't really like plots. I, d I don't really react to plots. I never had, like, since I was a kid, if you looking, going back all the way to the first things, I, mean, I would always get, people would always come after me, they're plotless. I mean, I don't like people who plot. I, a, a, per, a, a plotting personality is a person I don't want to be around. <laughs> I'm, I'm being serious. Like, if you're sitting there plotting, leave me alone. <laughs> And so why do I want to make a movie about plot? Uh, but I do love characters and narrative and people and things and, and vibe. I love when you feel something that you can't explain what it is. The film, it's what's called a film. The film, whatever the aggro is, the blink, the thing, the blink, it seems so radical now because it's put out, because I'm putting them out in a, also a commercial context, which is more fun for me. Right, because it's like you want to make these things in a way that's like that you're the most spiritually connected to. It's the most radical work, but it's most interesting for me to put them out in the most commercial context possible. That's where you affect the culture. That's the where, like, that's where people see the film. I love the art world. The art world for because the art world is also uh, there's something there's comforting about it in that it is you know, the people that generally go into galleries are more open and receptive and kind of like wanting something that's more mind expansive. At the same time, I like dropping bombs in the culture. Like, I really do like the disruption. And so, and I always have. And I also won't argue on for the merits of what I'm making. I'm not trying to say like, if you don't get it or understand it or think that you're wrong. I really just do this because I'm agitated. <laughs> by the culture? By yes. The, by the by, technology? By, by the aesthetic? By everything. And I want to make beautiful things. Like, I really want to make beautiful things and put them out there. I, I really want to, uh, you know, to add to the, to the language. Right. And, and, to, and in a base level to be entertaining. Um, and so a lot of it is because I, I see parts of it in different things, but I don't see it the way I want to see it. So then I try to, my best attempt at trying to, is to, tr to try to make it so that it exists. So I don't fight any react. I'm not really, it, the reactions, it's, it's all perfect. Mm -hmm. Like it's, it's perfect. Whatever you get from it or don't get or whatever, whatever, your re whatever you're reacting to is perfect. You know what I'm saying? I'm just making it the best that I can in, in a specific way and putting it out there. Yeah, I mean, I love that it can exist in the popular culture, in the mass culture, commercial culture, and yet there's so much about the work that I think would be lost on some of that world. You know, yeah. certainly not everyone. I exist in that world. We all do. Um, but as a art world professional and someone who does kind of understand histories of avant-garde movements and ruptures in another sense, in an aesthetic sense. I mean, I think there's a lot of places your work takes us to um, with regards to art, capital A, art, fine art. Um, and while those divisions are breaking down in a really great way, you know, I would argue you have um, uh, pieces like Haran Faroqi's um, kind of probing, which is a decade old now, probing of video game worlds and the edges of video game worlds. Um, also, Paul McCarthy, who may or may not be here Paul's today. Paul's right there. I mean, Paul, Paul's Mr. the... Mr. McCarthy and his... Um... I mean, honestly, that guy right there is one of the greatest artists in the... I mean, he's, he's, he, he really is the father of a lot of this. 
Yeah. I mean, a lot, a lot, a lot of me came from Paul. Yeah. He, I mean, yeah. he's really the, one of the sources. Yeah, I just, I, I see an artist like Paul, and of course there are other examples um, who push scale, and, and Paul is somebody who pushes sculptural scale and wants to take it further and further and bigger and bigger, and you, in a sense, are pushing that on a technological scale. But also what Paul did was like, and I'm not going to talk here you know, and give you compliments, but <laughs> it didn't exist before you, before him. He like invented a lane that did not exist. That's a very hard thing to do. Would you argue that's your goal? Do you want to do No, that? it just happens. I think, I don't know if you set out to do any of this stuff, but I think it, if it, it happens and somehow maybe you're able to, if you're lucky enough and you're able to survive, because it is not always easy, you know what I'm saying? And it is about, it is about the collective, it's a, or it's about the totality of the work, right? So like, it's not necessarily about the one thing, it's about the body of, of work, and the times that you're creating, and how you're reflecting that moment, and which you're, who you are in that moment. And so, if you're lucky, and you're healthy, and there's an audience for you and you're allowed to do it, you can create, someone like Paul can create this huge world that you can enter. It's like building a house. You build a house that you're able to, at the end of your life, that dream is that some of your movies or some of the films or the art or some of them are the floor, some are the, the, the chimney, some is, some's the bathroom. And then at the end of your life, you've built a house that you can live in. That's like the, the dream. Everything is made, it doesn't, it's not all huge. <laughs> Everything doesn't have to be earth shattering or earth changing or anything. Some can just be moments and then they stack and then it becomes this thing that is, can be quite ra radical and revolutionary. You've built some kind of crazy house. I think in, in terms of your latest work and this body of painting as well, I see you pushing technology and technique um, in a way that I haven't seen before, particularly with AI. I know I think we're all familiar at this point with the kind of mushy, um, like fleshy AI look and feel, and yet you kind of wield that technology in a really different way. I mean, there are definitely the moments of kind of Geiger-esque thick um, architectures inside faces, such as with this painting over here. Um, and yet there are these other really beautiful layerings of it, you know, the kind of roses and skulls that lay over the wife character's body. Um, I, know, I know you have a team of collaborators working with you on this, and so um, how are you able to kind of push something like AI, which already seems so kind of outdated, and yet you just showed me something new with it? I think it's just starting. I don't even think it's just data. I just don't even think it's barely existed. Yeah. I think it's just in its infancy. I think it's only going to accelerate. Hmm. Um, and also, it's like when people talk about AI, they, when people talk about AI, it means something different to everyone. So when people are talking about AI in this way that's like an existentialist threat to, you know, it's different than someone, than the way that I'm using AI. AI is a tool, and the idea that we would somehow go against that or that somehow it's a threat, I don't understand. Because again, it's in its infancy and it, it's something that helps create a, another realm, right? So we could even say that rather than being scared and this and it's gonna do this, well actually everything has a moment, right? So I feel that a lot of the old way, the old world is dying and the new world is, be, is beginning and creatively, meant for better or for worse, transhuman, it, transhumanism, whatever, whatever you want to talk about, there's no way to stop it, right? So then for me, it's like, well, how do I incorporate it and develop it into something for me that's interesting in a way that I can use it in my artwork that I wasn't able to do two years ago? That's really the only way. I'm, I'm not looking at, yes, it can take over and the robots will kill us and stuff. I mean, that might happen, but in the meantime, I'm just I'm using it uh, to 
to make things that I think are beautiful. Yeah, and it's not just you. I mean, I think that you do have a team of people intergenerationally, right. interdisciplinary that are helping you do it, but it does become this collective effort to just make and, and it's fail. A it's and a tool. <laughs> it's a tool. It's like another layer on the cake. It's like, um, you know, in the, the last, in the in agro, we use it, it's integrated, it's, you know, we integrated it into, the, into some of the imagery. It's like movement and it's a kind of... Uh, it's just like a new, another added layer, but I'm so curious because I, I am going to push it mm -hmm. and see, I, there, we are really working on developing things that I haven't, haven't seen, that I've never mm -hmm. seen before. Yeah, that's exciting. And the paintings here, very kind of classical in, a, in one sense. Um, is that an individual practice for you? Do you paint with your collaborators? Yeah. No, no, no. I mean, this is just in the studio. It's very, you know, the, it's actually a very kind of classic way of making art. I mean, a lot of this is projected onto canvas and just sitting there. Um, yeah, it's actually the, it, the, actually like the method of making these is probably the opposite of how we were. Mm -hmm. the, the complexity of the actual film is, it's different. It's the different. Do you like to have that counterpoint or do you need yeah, to have it's, it? it's great. I mean, I love the studio. I love also the quietness of it, the directness. It's painting is very similar to, at least my, to writing, where it's, mm -hmm. it's a more singular, isolated mood type of, thing. there's not so many people around. I mean, although you can have people in the studio, it's not, it's not always a collaborative, mm -hmm. you know, you don't have crews and, there, someone's not asking me why am I using the color blue and you make it green, yeah. you know, so it's good. Yeah, I think, um, you know, in so many of these pictures, there is that really painterly brushiness, you know, the kind of layering up, like in the palm trees over here, um, layering up of surfaces and getting those brushy edges, and yet you also have these really defined hard edges in, in trying to create the illusion of the thermal camera. Yeah. So, I mean, there is a kind of push and pull between the hard edge and the brushy, and yeah. I don't know, do you, do you just get in there? I and to put, like, tabs of acid on the... <laughs> 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 and did you? Yeah, just did lick you? the painting. No. Okay. <laughs> that would be going beyond painting. That's and, next. <laughs> Aesthetic yeah. drugs. And you have likened the film to a drug experience, you know? There is yeah, something but, I mean, hallucinatory I, about it. How, yeah, I mean, again, that's something sensory. It's like, yeah, how close? Is there a way to, is there a way to put the audience in an actual legit trance? Mm -hmm. That's something that uh, excites me. Yeah. Like, is there a way that, like, you know, you would have trance music or tra is there, like, rave cinema, trance cinema? Right. Yeah. Like, is there is there a kind of rhythm to the cuts and the imagery that will put you in a in a like an actual trance? Right. I mean, that's exciting. Yeah, I mean, there's <laughs> that sort of glitch abstraction or a, a glitch um, and yeah. a slowness too. Well, you I mean. know, like you where you walk out and it yeah. might take you like a week to to snap back. <laughs> <laughs> I I definitely walked out of your film feeling different and something but yeah. snap back um i guess i i, I want to stick on this idea of drug time and again like there are different time registers to different drugs and how different artworks might function like that and i think um seeing your films and seeing you know the video sculptures here as well there's a, a slowness and a, a kind of like I don't want to say sedativeness, yeah. but with the with the music, with the Arab music soundtrack, and kind of yeah. um, lulling you to this place of um, a lot of it is like loop based. There's a lot of right. looping, loop, loop. I like I have a kind of you know maybe obsessive personality where I can like listen to same songs over and over, or or sometimes I'll isolate like a couple like twenty seconds of a song and put it on a loop and listen to it for a few weeks. Um, and like I've been listening to the, this in the last couple of months, just only exclusively to this Nestle theme song from the, from the eighties, Sweet Dreams, uh, Nestle's theme song. And there's loops of it on YouTube, but I will just listen to it uh, 
for days and days. <laughs> but it, the reason I do it is because it gets me in the mood. Like, I, it gets me frisky. <laughs> and then what form does that friskiness take? I'm just joking. <laughs> <laughs> would, you, would you then go to Canvas? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I do like that. Yeah, 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 I like that. Yeah. Um, I want to ask you kind of one more question, which could maybe lead to a couple more, but I'm really curious about Florida and your living and working there and the kind of, um, the space that it offers you creatively. Um, you know, I think of Florida as a kind of surreal American landscape, hellscape, you know, all kinds of things with a... <laughs> a, kind of a permeable edge. What you know? happened to you on spring break? <laughs> uh, my ex was from Florida, so no. <laughs> um, the edges of Florida are, you know, permeable. It's like a, a space where things can kind of contaminate and get in and get out, and the Everglades are a land that is there and not there, and so just metaphorically, yeah. and maybe. Yeah, I get it. Yeah. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Something weird happened to you in Florida. <laughs> You're the one that lives there. <laughs> True. Uh, let's see. Uh, Florida, I just love Florida. Like, like Florida, I feel like it's Florida against the world. <laughs> um, you ever been to a, a place and the... the the psychogeography, you feel so connected to that place in a way that's beyond words. That's the way I feel about Florida. Um, Florida is the place, it's America, but it's not, a, it's its own. It's, when you say something is set in Florida, it's automatically a science fiction, right? That's a very special thing, right? You say, oh, this, taking, this thing is blah, blah, it takes place in Florida. Immediately, you know anything can happen. <laughs> um, and so it's a symbol in a lot of ways. Uh, I live, I like it. My wife, we like it because it's, and my kids, because it's like a, it's a vibe. It's really like, I like the, I like the way, it, I first moved there like a decade ago just because I liked the way it f felt. I like like this ocean and being on the ocean, the palm trees and the buildings and the sunsets and the and I grew up on um, you know uh, uh, Miami Vice the, was huge for me like Smokey it's like Smokey and the Bandit was big and Porky's and Miami Vice those are like the three things that set it all in motion. Um, Miami Vice was like really as a young person like got got its grip in me and. Michael Mann and like that whole thing, I was really affected by it. So I didn't grow up on the ocean. I grew up in Tennessee. And so uh, it was mostly just a feeling. Like we, I went there, I was like, wow, that's great. And then different parts, the Keys are different than the Everglades is different than the Northern part. So it's very much like a, it's its own country. Endlessly fascinating. And I, I mean, I look at, at Paintings like the speedboat over here, which I believe the title is, is it Pleasure or um, something similar to that? I don't know. I just throw them out. Oh, Paradise. Paradies. Paradise. Par paradise. Par it was Paradise Nuts. Paradise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Paradises. The palms over here are drone But codes. I know this is like a fancy gallery, so. <laughs> paradise. Yeah, but it is that, you know, that idea of, of the luxury fantasy or the fantasy scape that also offers the possibility of, you know, maybe other darker things being a fantasy as well. Yeah, yeah, you got it. <laughs> I, have, I have a colleague here who's, who's doing a lot of theoretical work around Florida. Yeah. So, um, you know, and, and definitely the, the archetypes here. I mean, are these characters inspired by your surroundings? Sorry. Yeah, I, a lot of the characters, th this, this thing in particular was a more dystopian, tropical thing, mm -hmm. was, was mostly hitmen, it's like a world where there's just like hitmen, it's, it's everything, it's yeah. basically, it's actually like, it's, 
when I was dreaming about it, I was like, it's a place completely de devoid of God. Hmm. And what, this is what happens when you're just left with vapors, right? So what's when God is gone or you're just left with vapors and style. And so this is kind of the absence of that. Mm -hmm. Although you have a character that's seeking some type of right. godly presence, uh, the this is like the afterburn. Yeah, yeah. You know, I think the which it can also be beautiful and seductive. Right. You know, which is why it's interesting. Yeah, the main character Bo in the film, who's the assassin, he's he's kind of um, to me the sort of emblem of male malaise, and he's he's lonely, he's sick of working. He's also a father, yeah. and he has these tender moments with his children yeah. and his wife. And, yeah. um, you know, I think there's, there's a kind of irony there that, you, that for all the guns and, you know, flash. He's and, also like a genius of murder. Right. But he yeah. hates his job. Right. He's a, so, and he's, he's full of love. In the and end, he's he says, full of, God is right. love. In the <laughs> end, that's the whole thing. After the journey, and he wipes out, yeah. you know, the entire city, he's like, all we're left with is love. Right the love of our children and God. So it, it, in some ways, it's a, I'm a religious filmmaker. <laughs> yeah. I'm, what is it? Uh, I mean, what, is, what are they called? Faith-based. I'm a faith-based artist. Faith artist. <laughs> I am I'm like a faith-based <laughs> artist. That's pretty cool. Well, um, you know, to, to bring... What was that one, Passion <laughs> of the Christ? That shit was good. <laughs> I'm going to bring it back to, to film and, and experimental film video. Our friend Paul McCarthy again. You know, Paul's made a great made a great film about the painter, the kind of dopey. Paul, you want to come up here? Hand-fisted painter. You, you want to come up? Come on. Yeah. It's just spontaneous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, this is really good. We have you here, Paul. Um, do you want to sit up here? Is it more no, comfortable? I like it down low. We give Paul a mic. <clears throat> there would be no me without this guy. <laughs> so, Paul, you know, I was I was comparing. Um, uh, Harmony's latest character to some of your characters and, and this idea of a kind of failed man or like the failed painter, the sort of uh, like schlumpy <laughs> masculine character, the impotent masculine character. What do you think of that? What do you think of, of sad men, emotional men? <laughs> Broken men. <laughs> Broken men. <laughs> and I should note that you are a feminist as well, so... Let's let's uh, use some more. How do I? Uh, the last two things I've done are two or three, two years of being Donald Trump, <clears throat> and from there I went to Adolf Hitler. So, so I've done pieces about Donald Trump that occupied two years, and and his family. And the last two years have been, well, maybe longer, three years, have been Adolf Hitler and Ava Braun. And Ava Braun is Marilyn Monroe. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Try to top that shit. <laughs> this motherfucker's radical. Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't stop there. I mean, you've done kind of... Failed cowboys, you've done uh, pirates, failed pirates. Well, Paul's built worlds. Yeah. That's the thing. That's like why he's like an influence to guys like me. Because he wasn't just like, I, I, I mean, he was just an artist. I, didn't, I would never call him a painter or a sculptor. I was like, he's like the whole, it, he was like one of those people that you saw was like, there's really nothing, no point in defining any of it because it's world creation. Like he's building like a a, a, a language. <clears throat> so how did that happen? 
uh, I mean, I think in the last few years, I've really thought that art was critical, super, super important. And I think that when you were talking, I thought the beginning was really good, this thing of not being able to put it into words and getting into a situation where I'm asked to put things in words. And, and things get so layered and so complicated. I try to get it down to where you answer a question, a simple one like, what's art? And uh, so now that's one thing. And then I think it was something you were saying about other worlds. And I, I was trying to think about, you know, this thing of uh, technology. And, and I also kind of feel like going, going as deep as I can into technology, whatever tools I have or whatever I can get my hands on. <clears throat> but one thing that maybe is slightly different than your practice and my practice is that I'm always trying to be in it. So, but it's similar in some ways because it, it you know, being Donald Trump or being Adolf Hitler is like in a, a video game is like an avatar of some sort, right? Like you find yourself, and I think, you know, the this uh, whatever, you know, whatever whether there's a future of actually embodying something in a virtual way, I don't know, but there is something about these pieces I'm making where I become, take on the character. It, it has relationships to acting, I guess, but it's like, but acting as primal, right? Like, uh, or toe or something. Well, you're like always, per yeah, you're, what's so cool about what you do is it's so performative too, that you're, like you said, inside of it. Yeah, and I think the subject of trance is interesting. And you, when you were talking, like, I, I made a film, this film I made with this Donald Trump, and we drank a lot of alcohol. As Adolf Hitler, I drank a lot. But, <laughs> um, one of the things was this thing of the trance or this thing of being drunk. And there was one, f when we got through with this one film and Damon edited it, I think a lot of people who watched it said, I feel like I'm drunk. I feel like I'm, and it is in the rhythm of the film, like this thing of, and when you were describing the repetition. And I think there's something like, you can't, there is a, a thing of different than like a painting, which I think with some people, the sensitivity to a static object is really there. They really can feel something really ultra, you know, inside yeah. themselves. And, I, and when you find these kinds of people that could feel like that, it's pretty incredible. But because uh, most people can't see it, but and that's just because the hypnosis of that we're all in. But I think there's something interesting about film and these technologies of time and how you go through time and uh, in, these, in these images, right? Like I think the subject of a film that puts you in a trance, totally feasible, does happen, you know? And uh, like this film, you know, yeah, there are people we're drunk, so that looks like people identify with the drunk and they realize, oh, they're drunk. But there's something in how the film is structured, how it's shot, and how it's edited that I think you watch it and you feel drunk. You feel... What else could you want? And that's my... <laughs> I mean, Harmony, did you feel that way working with Jordi Mora and Travis Scott, you know, kind of leaning into your actors for their performance? Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the, the performances in, in this are, were really designed to almost feel like, of, like characters in a game. So like the way that they moved and the, the platitudes and the words that they used and how they expressed themselves. A lot of it was like we would like watch Elden's Ring or, you know, or some different different games and kind of like, or GTA or whatever it was, and so oh, you mimic some of the, the movements. Um, it wasn't like a traditional, there was no, I didn't even, I don't, 
I don't even really use traditional scripts. There wasn't even really a script. Again, it wasn't even a, meant to be a, a movie. So a lot of it was like freestyle, the way you would like freestyle like a rap song or something. Uh, it was freestyled around an idea, uh, characters and things. Um, but yeah, they were, it, it was more, they were, they were kind of more tapped into something else rather than like traditional, like dramatic so-and-so. Yeah, I mean, I think that's also what was so notable in, in your new film is works like Paul's uh, films and his performance history, there's a real defined duration. Like it can just go on forever and you can be in this loop of, of action or um, reaction. And with your assassin character, you know, there are, there are moments where he's in his apartment just kind of doing nothing, just, you know, yeah. waiting, looking, you know, slow. And Can I also just say it's cool to be with Paul? I've known Paul, so I was a, it's cool for me because I, I was a kid with him. Like, we were, I was like 20 years old, like hanging out in Bergamot Station with Mike Kelly and, and, and Paul. It's like, it's, it's like an amazing thing for me to be here. I admired him so much. He was like such a hero, you know, for, so it's like, and then life really, it moves quickly. That's the other thing. It's like, wow, goes fast. You better enjoy it, motherfuckers. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's good, right? Thank you. I think that's good, right? Unless you have anything else. Yeah, it's a perk. Yeah. Th thank you all. I love you all. Sweet. I'm up in this bitch. <laughs> this guy. Thank, thank you. you all. Oh, Harmony. Harmony. When, when will the film be released in the U.S.? The film, I'm gonna release it uh, on Fortnite. No, I'm just kidding. I, I, I'm gonna, I'm releasing it in uh, Roblox. No, I'm just joking. I'm re uh, releasing it um, on uh, Twitch. Actually, uh, uh, well, we shall see. It, uh, we have our own platform that we've built, so I'll probably we're like figuring it out right now. But we'll, it'll be in the movie theaters in probably eight weeks or something. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.